Okay, great. So we're going to talk um, about um, IoT and the connected device economy um, and well, how blockchain sits in that in the future. What's really cool about this panel is we're going to use all the buzzwords and hand wavy stuff like big data, AI, drones, um, autonomous devices, and so on. So, um, so I think it's going to be a really fun discussion. So I'm just going to ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves, just in case nobody knows me. I'm Christina Frankopan. I'm a venture partner with um, Fabric Ventures, um, background in finance, um, and I've been kicking around in the blockchain space since uh, 2015, um, advising investors and supporting technologists with their projects. Um, so should we start with just some brief introductions and maybe mention the interest in IoT specifically? No, yes, of course. Uh, my name is Ekaterina. I'm representing Samsung. Uh, I'm leading investments for Samsung in Europe, but specifically a Samsung Catalyst Fund uh, that is focusing on cutting-edge technologies, uh, so the futuristic, so to say, technologies uh, that uh, Samsung could use for building new platforms. And, uh, you know, Samsung, I think, is one of the companies that will benefit uh, most, perhaps, uh, from the decentralization revolution that is happening today. Uh, Samsung is producing a lot of uh, different devices, starting from semiconductor chips uh, to uh, mobile phones, to refrigerators, to vacuum cleaners. Everything needs to be intelligent today. Uh, and, of course, generating a lot of data. And this uh, revolution that is happening in blockchain today, of course, will allow to uh, monetize in the future a lot of those uh, use cases. So, of course, IoT and blockchain are very interesting, and let's talk about this more. Hi, uh, I'm Dimitri. I, five years ago, uh, we started something called Ascribe, which was um, Bitcoin for artists, you could say, intellectual property on the, on the Bitcoin ledger. And then we moved on into more exploring the data aspect, uh, the public uh, networks for data. Um, one of the things we done was BigchainDB, and now we moved on to another pro product. Uh, BigchainDB is up and running production, um, and newer uh, version of it is called Ocean Protocol. I think the thing we want to achieve there is something we call democratic intelligence networks or public intelligence network. Think about Watson, but they're not owned by a single company, but owned by humanity. Uh, I have a background in microelectronics, so I love everything around IoT devices and chips and with machines becoming autonomous and hive minds. Uh, a lot of buzzwords here. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Okay. Hi. I'm uh, Carl Rodriguez, and I'm working with Streamer uh, involved in partnerships. Streamer is helping to really catalyze a, a real-time data economy and uh, reconfigure the relationships really uh, between uh, machines and also individuals uh, as well as companies when it comes to real-time data. Uh, I think you know, we're in a, an age where sometimes the, the big data is uh, perhaps concentrated sometimes in the hands of, of maybe a few uh, big corporations and we see that there's a, there's a way of uh, perhaps unlocking some of the value for individuals, empowering individuals and also having a landscape for machines to be involved in that mix. Uh, and how that's all going to play itself out in a decentralized peer-to-peer uh, -peer network. Uh, my own background is, is uh, having worked in data for a long time. Uh, got into the web when I, I used to read sort of Marketing Week and it was in direct marketing and saw this kind of, what's this Yahoo with an exclamation mark? I didn't really understand how you could have an exclamation mark at the end of a company name and it all sounded quite intriguing. So I got into the web and... Uh, have been seeing the journey of data, open data, and now real-time data, and how we can monetize that uh, and uh, create some more value uh, out of all this uh, data that's being absorbed in a way that people can actually digest it and, uh, and do something with it. So that's uh, me. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. So my name is Julian. Um, I've got a background, master in microelectronics, like Dimitri in France, as well as my French accent and a uh, master in AI in computer science, um, decentralized system in the state back in 2009, what now you guys call blockchain. Um, and I uh, got first introduced in Bitcoin in 2009 and then went to all the story about like uh, Mongox and all this stuff and then got introduced in Ethereum about like 2015, 2015, early 2016. Um, built some different kind of decentralized application, energy trading, high frequency trading. Um, and also last year about project in decentralized identity system for emerging market in developing countries and now involving flying carpet. Flying carpet is all the busy words you can hear. 
It's like um, IoT, AI, blockchain, VR, uh, augmented reality. Um, tell me another one and I will add it in a project. But um, <laughs> yeah. uh, basically what we're doing is like, uh, we're building different proof of concept worldwide. Um, so we, we, we're not like building a marketplace yet. So we're choosing another path, which is basically building different kind of proof of concept, different application. And then if they're successful, then we'll link all together and maybe build a marketplace. But it's basically about finding mathematical patterns outside of, out of a video stream. And we're using drones at the moment in different countries to um, build a blockchain and AI application on top of it. Cool. Fantastic, super exciting. Um, in full disclosure, we are actually invested in um, Ocean Protocol and in Streamer, just so, so for full transparency. Um, so let's start by just sort of defining the space a little bit, because IoT in some senses has got a bit of a bad rap um, uh, in the sort of public um, meme space, um, even though it's being heavily implemented in, in industrial and uh, manufacturing settings and agricultural as well. Um, but, but in the sort of uh, public awareness, IoT use cases have not really, um, are not really manifest other than the you know, very simplistic cases. What are the features of this blockchain-enabled environment that is going to perhaps uh, bring new op opportunities, new possibilities, and possibly even new economies to this space? What are the features of that interaction between blockchain and IoT that is potentially exciting? Mm. I start well. Well, let me start with maybe some numbers. Um, uh, we know now that we have a new protocol for internet, which is IPv6. And IPv6, do you know how many addresses are in IPv6? It's 300 trillion, trillion, trillion. It's 10 in, uh, to power 36. And we don't even have the name for this. And this is how many devices and entities we expect to be there, out there. So the largest number I think we have today is actually a, a Yotobyte, which is a 24th power. So this, we expect all these devices, and we call them Internet of Things because we expect them to be connected and to generate some data. And by 2025, we expect that, I don't know, 160 zettabytes of data will be generated uh, per year. And this would require, someone told me, I didn't check, but someone told me it requires 12 trillion Samsung S9 phones to store all this data, 12 trillion. So we have all these devices that apparently are communicating and, and um, will help us to live better. However, we don't have today a um, good mechanism of data exchange and, no, and extracting value from all this data and all these devices that we have. We are trying and we're trying hard since probably late 90s, but we still, this, this is not happening today. I can give you an example. I was in uh, late 90s, I was very much driving the peer-to-peer -peer topic, and it was the, when Napster just appeared and everyone was scared about all what's going to happen to the world when all people are starting just to communicate suddenly directly. It's no reg reg regulators were completely freaking out. And in the US, conferences were mostly about how to how to make this happen and regulate, how we involve regulators into this. So today, peer-to-peer -peer happened. We know this. We, we can exchange uh, information directly. However, we have a huge problem of trust. So identity management and trust and, and marketplaces for exchange of data do not really exist. We are trying to create. We have examples, for example, company Mapillary, uh, we have invested in in Sweden, they have created a marketplace uh, for data exchange for autonomous driving, which is fantastic. And, and these are first examples where the market go is going. We need much more of this in different verticals. So I think this is a huge problem that we are trying to resolve. And blockchain, to be honest, we see it as an enabler of those things happening in the future. And uh, of course, we hope that it will work. So we are hoping and we're betting on all these uh, great things that are happening today. Um, but this is actually the movement is really to make those things happen in, in real time. And, uh, mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Do you want to comment sure. on that? Um, I guess wh what I see happening is that, uh, well, you could talk about connected devices, but I, I think it's more interesting that, to see, for example, what happened with things like share and charge and other things where devices get a wallet. They become actually economical agents and they, they own their own resources and not necessarily have a human guardian. 
And this is interesting because no laws can cover that. Um, so you see this typical example of a charging pole communicating with an electrical vehicle, and that has been built in, uh, I mean, with Energy in Berlin. Uh, I think we have about 1,500 charging poles actually doing that. So every time the charging pole generates energy, it mints a coin, uh, and that it uses as a value exchange. And then more recently, uh, uh, at a hackathon, so some crazy guys took our product Big Chain B and put it indeed on drones. And you could actually see them like form a form of hive mind where they share all the state of the world with each other. And they communicate through transactions at the lowest level. So think about adding a layer of intelligence on top of that. And then they can go into rescue missions, mapping, and, and basically communicate in a form that hasn't been possible before because they have something called the world state. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's something interesting for humans to explore because what happens if machines can own resources and decide what to do with them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, absolutely great. So data, new ways of monetizing data, um, streams and big data, um, <coughs> and machine-to-machine uh, -machine interactions and transactions. What, what, are, what other features are, are unique about this space and new opportunities that might arise from these kinds of features? Um, yeah, so you were talking, Dimitri, you were talking about charging station. That's um, one of the um, uh, device that we built for flying carpet. Um, so we've got um, a flying carpet charging docking station. So it's completely decentralized. You buy it. Um, so the, the vision is to buy it for 150 US dollar. You can place it in your balcony or your garden on the countryside. And what we do is like uh, any drone on the protocol knows uh, where to go and where to charge. So then you earn money. So that's basically what we're building, and then you can have those kind of swarm of drones that can learn about the, the real estate, um, uh, like the state of the environment, and then they can learn about you, between each other, share information, like a swarm, so like ETM swarm, but like more like in a physical uh, application. That's what we're doing. So you guys can make money, you can plug any drone and adopt to the protocol, and then you can gather data. Um, I see the potential of blockchain and AI is really for the individual um, in order to generate money, re revenue stream, so basically, we've got so many IoT devices, and we think about like how, how can the IoT device can transmit data and all this stuff. But in the day, it's also for the consumer. So like in terms of you got your phone, your phone is tracking um, your activity uh, during the day. You how many stairs you you climb, how many I don't know like how many kilometers you're doing a day, and this can actually be sold on a on a, on a blockchain public marketplace. Um, so it's it's about like building an AI agent that is responsible for you. It's like uh, having an AI avatar that is just protecting your privacy, protecting your data, selling data, making money about for you, and then sell this information for you, encrypted or publicly. <coughs> it doesn't matter. Um, well, it matters if you if you choose. But um, yeah, I think it's just enabling the the potential of having something that is responsible, caring about you, and then making money for you. Like maybe we can think about um, um, how do we call it like the, um, a salary, like a revenue, like a basic income. That will basically be your phone gathering data for you and selling in the public market. Fascinating. New, new economies emerging from this, this uh, interaction of technologies? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's nicely teed up. I was, I was going to talk about smartphones because I think sometimes you know, we think about blockchain and how it will be almost invisible to a lot of the end users who aren't that bothered about blockchain you know, out in the, out in the street outside. And uh, we've been doing a partnership with Zippy uh, f to develop a, a blockchain smartphone, for example, where uh, the, the guy who founded the Fujis has set up a, a project called Blackcher. And this is an application, a real, real life uh, application that's, that's happening right now, where um, it describes the black community can share data on various different topics like urban development, jobs, health, uh, and then monetize that on an individual level. Uh, and one of the things we're developing as well, um, we're developing a, a data marketplace so individuals can get that monetization and the blockchain makes the, you know, the transactions on a, you know, a finite small microtransactional level on a daily basis, all the different apps they're using, the data they're sharing, that can all be you know, obviously automated and, and, and uh, functionally uh, enabled by the blockchain. But from a user experience point of view, they're, they're just using a phone and just using apps. Um, but the monetization piece can happen on an individual level as well as on a, on a company and aggregated uh, level as well. So it's kind of this, what I was saying earlier about how you can get individuals who are, who are monetizing and getting revenue shares, but also companies, is, companies are still involved and start, companies still have their, 
business models that are relevant and, and can suddenly get actually quite a lot of engagement and brand loyalty from their individuals who are also uh, connected with them. So if you think about the phone, but also the car, uh, the car's obviously going around uh, driving and, and could be used for so many different applications. I mean, we're, we're looking at pothole detection, for example, at the moment, and I know uh, other initiatives like bus, bus companies are thinking, well, we're already driving around the highways can we not just actually capitalise on that fact that we've got a vehicle going around? There's so many different uh, things that can be measured, obviously, with these sensors. We're working with Hewlett Packard Enterprise, for example, edge computing in the car that can gather a load of data around things like road condition or uh, you know, the gearing, the tyre wear and so on. So we can start to actually harness things without necessarily creating everything from scratch. You know, people have got a smartphone, but now it's, OK, have a smartphone that can make you money. Uh, and then obviously there is this idea of a marketplace that can bring all of these different things together, whether it's a, you know, in a smart city. Everything's interdependent in a smart city. You know, you've got everything impacts everything else. You know, if something leaks over here, it affects the traffic congestion. You know, we, we're kind of aware that, that everything fits together, but how do we actually uh, get that all working together? If you get some centralised places where there is a lot of data all in one place, then we're empowering these kind of AI systems that are very hungry for a lot of data, and you can start to do the predictive analysis and the maintenance people start to get what they need. You start to refine the data, uh, and you start to uh, you know, get more value from things that are already being gathered, but currently not analyzed and actually used. I think Carl is making a very valid point that actually those marketplaces are not only for individuals, it's actually also for companies. So we are not talking about maybe fully decentralized system, but hybrid solutions. But it's actually where companies are also benefiting a lot. Today, uh, gathering, acquiring data is a super expensive process, and we know this from, from the automotive industry. So to create maps is a very expensive and lengthy process, and that's why data is required. And we know that there are so many cars driving around, as you are saying, and, and they could actually capture this data and, and, and sell it, and it's uh, probably big uh, map manufacturing. Um, other examples, company in, uh, in Belgium, Sentience, actually they, they have a lot of analytics on the phone. They already capture a lot of analytics and can get profiling of people that people today exchange for services. But actually this data is super valuable for uh, municipalities to understand traffic of users and mobility um, patterns in the city. And this data cannot be uh, accessed today because there is no meaningful platform how to access this data and how users can benefit from this access. So I think these are all interesting uh, developments. Yeah, great. So yeah, leveraging, leveraging big data and reaping new kinds of data to create better environments for societies and, and revenue streams for companies and individuals. It's, um, it's all pretty exciting. I just want to go back to this, since we're at an AI conference, I mean, this idea of, of what the AI level can do with IoT in terms of thinking about autonomous, and you mentioned something about um, autonomous machines and, um, you know, at the base level you can have machine-to-machine -machine interactions and transactions, but, but if you apply the AI on top of that, that's when things get very exciting and, and indeed complicated. You know, what is the legal status, for example, of a machine that is negotiating with your data with another machine um, and, and so on? Maybe you want to comment on, on what, what is the bigger vision of uh, how powerful those kinds of systems could, could be and what, what autonomous agents in that sense would look like? Yeah, I, I think um, one of the key realizations is something called public utility networks. Uh, it's not necessarily a marketplace. It's more, um, it's a network of infrastructure that's just there and operates at lowest marginal cost um, in order for people to maybe consume energy or data or intelligence in the end. Um, what I feel with, uh, what, what, what you can do with these things is if you look at AI and, and, and machine learning, then you create public utility networks for machine learning and intelligence. This means that everybody can contribute. If you have a, a cool algorithm that, that, that proves its value, you throw it in a network. Every time it gets run, you get some value out of it. That value doesn't have to be monetary. It can also be like you contribute to something to uh, maybe data to an intelligence system. What you get back is your personal coach or some, some consolidation of your own data. So. What, what we see that you can try to build is, for example, uh, think about a global recommender, a universal recommender, which 
it's not only like targeting your Netflix, but actually lo looks across fully horizontal across all the breadcrumbs that you have in your digital life, but only not only yours, but also the ones of everybody else. So this poses a very interesting thing because they're valuable to us if we can expose our internal attributes, our private data. Um, and that, of course, leads to some threats if you can do this in a public environment. So a lot of people are trying to look into something called privacy-preserving machine learning techniques in order to basically consolidate knowledge without actually seeing the data and hence create, you could call it, AI models for the commons, for the global. Not owned by a single entity, but actually globally owned. And you could say that then they fork towards your personal needs. Think about contributing to a DNA data bank. Uh, it maps the state of, uh, of the health of, of humans. And then you specify towards your personal DNA, and it becomes actually your health coach. So if you contribute the data, what you get back is a coach. So there's m many, many other applications there. But I think the main thing is collaborative models. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. Um, what about, Julien, what do you think for AI? How, um, how powerful could those systems be when we have autonomous? And what are the threats, for example? I mean, if we have, you had mentioned at some point, um, <clears throat> you know, autonomous machines and, and indeed autonomous weapons when we have, we're already in a world of 3D printing guns, but, but, when, but, but what, can, what can we imagine and what are the threats um, uh, of, of these kinds of AI systems, you know, even before we get to singularity? Okay, uh, yeah, so for the recall, I, I spent two years of my life building autonomous weapons. Um, that was for security defense company. So, uh, so I, I quit, so then I built a, um, a non-profit project to kind of like redemption, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> So no, I've, I, I've done my duty. Um, so yeah, I think um, the problem of, because we already have, I mean, we can agree, uh, agree on that. We don't have like consciousness yes, yet, but we got like AI system like DeepMind is doing with um, like kind of black box and um, they solved the problem of Go, Go game, which was the most, probably the most difficult, difficult game ever. And um, people like in Tizen, Tizen, uh, five or something. All the AI community was saying that if we, that will be never, we will never see any AI coming. Uh, like we can take the example of Go game. We, if we are actually find an AI agent that can beat the Go game, then we can actually ask a question about consciousness because this Go game is about like uh, like feelings and all this stuff. But we actually beat it. Uh, we um, like it was like three years ago, four years ago, uh, the Go game. Uh, the, 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 the main problem of uh, that is like when you build an AI system that can do the job, you don't really know um, how it works inside, how it works inside the black box. And um, then if you're talking about blockchain and having decentralized kind of infrastructure where data can, flu can fly all around the place and you can make transaction, is the question is what happens when you have an AI agent, like a black box that enter the blockchain and then just feed himself so for example, you can think about yourself um, are looking for building a really nice landing page for your new KeyCast project. Uh, so you post the need on the marketplace saying, um, I want to build this fantastic landing page. And then you just add your information on the, on the, on the website. And then like uh, two minutes later, you've got this guy saying, oh, I can build it for you for that much. You said, oh, yes, cool. You got good ratings. So then you pay, uh, you don't pay, you wait for the landing page, you see the landing page, the landing page is fantastic, it's just like those, everything you, you were looking for. Um, but, so then you pay the guy, and then that's it. Well, what you don't really know, uh, what you don't know, it's this, um, this uh, guy that built the landing page for you was just an AI agent. And then this guy got the money, what he does with the money, is just buy more power on AWS to get stronger and to do more tasks. So then you just accelerate his, uh, is knowledge and then how you can build more tasks and then you cannot stop it. So we're basically building, I don't want to scare anyone, but we're basically building like a blockchain that can, uh, application that cannot be stopped and then AI agent system that we don't really understand how it works inside, but they can do the job. So I think it's pretty, it's pretty scary. Um, uh, yeah, so I was doing AI stuff for the security defense. So um, back then in 2009, I was started, that's why it, Back then, we were already building some very, very, very scary stuff. Um, so I can imagine 10 years later about AI, and now we're building blockchain for, for the, the public. So yeah, I think we still, we should ask questions, and I think the guy that is asking, uh, is um, giving his public opinion is like Elon Musk with OpenAI, and 
I mean, recently, um, Elon Musk quit. I think he quit. Yeah, officially quit OpenAI. And um, yeah, so I think we, we've got stuff. Up, uh, I mean, there's stuff happening there. We all like super excited about building blockchain and crypto to the moon, making a lot of money. Um, but at the same time, I think there's a massive threat coming, and we don't really. At the moment, we don't really care about it. But I think it's and this problem of AI. AI, we see a we see. Um, I mean, humans, we wake up in the morning, we have a 24 hours day normally, uh, yeah, maximum. But AI doesn't actually, um, is not um, limit to time, it's just limit to power, comp comp uh, power of computation. So when you read the news in the newspaper talking about Go Game, Google beat the Go Game, uh, well, when you read it in this news, it's just like looking at maybe 100 years back for AI, because AI already process more information in just in less than two hours, or less than 24 hours. So when you read the news about AI or the Go game or DeepMind doing some task, you're basically looking at 100 years for the AI. Like, it's just, so yeah. Yeah, well, uh, interesting and scary. Um, yeah, so how do we, I mean, I don't know if you have some thoughts on this or anyone else wants to chip in, but how do we, how do we as a community, or, or those of you who are practitioners in this sector, how do you, self-regulate or otherwise find ways to, well, not only to be technically compliant with things like GDPR in terms of data privacy, but, but also ensure that we um, design systems that are, that are open but, but safe, um, or, or, or is there no way to control these kinds of open software and hardware systems? Um, well, yeah, w one of the most important things is that um, this has to be done in public. Um, it cannot be like a black box inside of a company with and, uh, or any type of private institution. Like Intel, yeah. You like Intel, yeah? Intel, yeah, there's many others. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's evil insight. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, these things b really belong to, to, to humanity, mm. and, and they have to be controlled by, by entire humanity, and, and, and there has to be diversification of people that give inputs and the ethics and all of that. Um, but I don't see it as something scary. I, I more see it as hands holding. Mm -hmm. I, I more see it like adding more permissions gradually over time and, and, and getting that form of at least a pause button. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I don't think we always have to look at it from a doom I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying this. It, I mean, I think short term is massive potential. I mean, short term, we're talking about like finding mathematical patterns. Uh, I think my team will love because I always mention mathematical patterns. But uh, uh, it's basically finding new mathematical patterns outside of kind of like new disease, like how to fight cancer, how to fight uh, AIDS, how to fight like in developing country, finding new potential to generate money. For example, with uh, flying carpet, uh, I'm not trying to advertise the project, but um, so we, we in Papua New Guinea, what we've been doing is like basically counting the number of coconut implantation. And um, so for the farmer, it's a massive potential because as soon as you can gather data about communities, then you're talking about building uh, a coconut futures. And basically, the farmer can make more money by selling data about how many coconut is going to build in three or six months' time than actually selling the coconut. Because a lot of people in the city, like for trading, they will buy this data. Um, and what I'm saying about AI is just short term as a massive potential because we, AI will not be strong enough to maybe, I mean, you have to believe in consciousness or not consciousness, is AI able to make consciousness or not? But the thing is like, I think short term is a massive potential, but medium and long term, I think there's a risk. And if you say no, I think it's kind of like not seeing, I mean, it's kind of lying to yourself because mm -hmm. if you build something that can sing by himself, build, grow by himself, make money by himself, and then on a decentralized infrastructure that you cannot stop, like Ethereum, then you're basically building something that is faster than humans and can make well, it. So it like my children, actually. Fortunately, we are very far away yet from there. With all respect to all the progress that we have done so far in artificial intelligence, we know that fully autonomous systems are very difficult to build yet. So, and, and I agree with you about risks, like but we, are, we, we still... The AI guy from Go Game was saying that 10 years ago, and we were already there. They said oh, we never see an AI system be able to beat Go Game in 100 years. 10 years later, boom. I think there's a big thing about balance. It always just seems to come up in my life. Like I used to work in open data a lot, and then I kind of went into sort of monetizing data. <clears throat> and obviously, there's this kind of nice <clears throat> balancing point between where we can open up data as a society, or we can design systems that are open, 
So our marketplace is open source and, and it's, it's, it's got that transparency about it. I know uh, I think uh, Jeff Bezos talks a lot about designing for open, having open systems, and that you know, like what we're all doing kind of in this, in this environment is we are designing more efficient systems that will, you know, if, if things are more open, they're more collaborative. And I think cl collaboration and balance seem to be on there. They're not necessarily the buzzwords like blockchain and AI, but they seem to be buzzwords that are just hugely important as we realize really that we do need to collaborate more and blockchain enables or marketplaces enable these clusters of, you know, networks to kind of collaborate or, or machines to collaborate within all of that. There isn't a kind of black and white, it needs to be this way or that way. I think there's often this kind of hybrid middle of the middle of the two extremes path. So you can design things for open, but obviously at the same time you, you have the, you know, the privacy and the security and everything's locked down in a, in a kind of disciplined way. Uh, and then, you know, it, you don't have, you kind of get then, I suppose, a society which does have different opinions as well can almost like find, well, actually, there is this kind of yep. balance in between. And it, it's an interesting question, I mean, if, you know, in the context of open data, open source software, open hardware, um, and collaboration that, that, that you guys work in, I, I, one wonders how. Um, how it'll be interesting to see whether that scales, um, put it that way, because when um, when uh, there are ho higher stakes, even higher stakes, um, people tend to coagulate um, into um, groups, uh, group thinking. But yeah, no, I think that's a very valid point. And maybe we could just talk about that open hardware piece and a little bit about the technical challenges of, of um, building hardware. It's notoriously difficult to build, uh, to work on hardware projects. Um, uh, especially when you're talking about applying several layers of complex technology, blockchain and AI of various kinds. Um, what, what are the specific um, issues in terms of open or closed hardware uh, development in this IoT space? So I think the thinking is going, the philosophical thinking is going towards opening uh, and having open ecosystems where actually you can build uh, solutions with third parties uh, together. However, we are very concerned about cybersecurity, and I think everyone is concerned. And we have, i just give a couple of examples, I'm sure you know about them. One of the examples is pacemaking machines. There was an, uh, a case two years ago where uh, uh, pacemaking machines, hard pacemaking machines were hacked mm -hmm. uh, just to demonstrate that it's possible. And then it was a, basically there was a hedge fund behind who did it because they wanted to play on the financial returns. The matter of fact, 500,000 uh, uh, 500, yeah, uh, devices had to be recalled from the market, and some of them, they were already in the bodies. So uh, the thing that it re reveals is actually we, we used to deal with the denial of service attacks, and now we are dealing more and more with the denial of life attacks. And this is all starting from hardware, because we have hardware everywhere. We have hardware in our bodies, we have hardware on our bodies that help us to live better, we have hardware that is taking decisions for us in our cars, and it's getting to this point. So even on, on the cars, there was a team uh, uh, that hacked Jeep remotely several times, and they demonstrate that you can actually control any autonomous car or any car actually remotely, which is quite scary. So we need to be really, we need to rethink how we build systems from, from very bottom up. And, uh, and it's, it's in the process now. I think we are all, as, as a community, we are thinking about this. There are, uh, we need to think about hardware. When we build hardware, it's not only about uh, what stack and what security protections we put there, but we need to trust those security protections. So it's going even for where we manufacture. Do we trust the place where man we manufacture hardware? And we put there keys that we need to be uh, sure that the keys are actually safe, but if they're hacked for some reasons and, and the device is inside of our bodies, we need to be able to exchange those keys on the fly, and this process has to be super secure. So we need all this secure communication and all these things. And then it goes all the way up. So when we end up, actually what we, we talk about, we, we want an open uh, stack, but actually a stack that we can trust. So what it turns out to be that we need to work very closely with all the partners to ensure that this stack is super secure. It's not like we can go out whenever we want and just buy any piece of this stack when we want, but we actually need to work the whole way through with all the partners to make sure that there are no leaks in the system. Because any, any, the weakest uh, part of the solution will be, be, become a threat. 
and potential denial of life threat. D yeah, denial of life tax, that's, that's a whole new thing to worry about. Um, any other, anyone else want to comment on the open hardware piece? Uh, sure. Uh, I think what we've seen in the open source community for code is very interesting because uh, basically we put out some open source code, um, created a network out of it, a few of them, and then now they hold uh, a few hundred billion of value. So these are really honeypots for hackers. Everybody can see what's happening inside. And you have purely public surveillance. You, you have all these, like it, it's, it's a massive bounty. And, yeah. and these systems tend to become way more hardened than any type of banking grade security system that you can think of because there are so many eyes looking at the same thing. Uh, so a code, uh, any error in this design will get noticed because you can extract value from it. Um, hardware hasn't gone to that level. It's, it's very proprietary. Um, I used to work in there and then we had like just the design files was already like high security stuff. If you go into uh, 12 nanometer uh, CMOS technologies, then if you leak those files, then they go crazy. Um, but it doesn't really make sense to put open source hardware on closed source, uh, open source software on closed source uh, hardware. Uh, especially if you go into privacy preserving machine learning where there are hard baked private keys inside of this hardware that guarantee your security, then you're really like uh, trusting the company that produces the hardware in order not to have your assets being stolen or backdoored or something like that. So an open hardware initiative, it's coming up. There are a few uh, uh, people at MIT and, uh, and others uh, building this, but I think they're still miles away from what the Samsungs and the TSMCs and the UMCs and the global foundries are actually being able to produce at massive scale right now. So, so the, the ideal state of completely permissionless IoT blockchain innovation in this sense is, is some time away, perhaps. Yeah, I think like the, the, the op more it's open source, more it's secure, more it's safe. And then before, like 10 years ago, people were like, no, no, if it's, if it's open source, they cannot be saved because people can read the code. We, we're going to the opposite. The more you see, more you safe. So. Yeah, I mean, again, a question comes from, you know, in the context of this open hardware um, future, if we imagine it, it's, it's, it's great for tinkerers and makers, but I, I, again, I wonder how easy it is for projects to scale real IoT hardware projects um, in, yeah, so in, in they, that context. Yeah, sorry, so they, um, like for example, um, Intel or ARM, they will need to build encryption at the, at the low level, so le layer, layer one. Mm -hmm. um, so like um, a microcontroller that can encrypt uh, information and then what we call now they're building a TEE, so a trust environment system where the information cannot be leaked outside of the core. Uh, very low level of the, uh, the the programming system, so this is very important. And yet we don't have the systems. So whatever is built on the market, like Ledger Nano, like uh, all this kind of wallet, what we say that they're safe, but not really. And they're just safer than what we've got at the moment. And uh, all this IoT device can be hacked. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a matter of like uh, we've got like some few, few different projects in the market, like also like nice project like Foam, like decentralized location-based system, or like any kind of IoT device that need the mass cons mass uh, IoT devices. The I think in order for them to be safe, we have to look at the incentivization to be hacked to hack a device compared to how much it will cost a hacker to hack the device. This is very something very important. And if it's fully decentralized, meaning that if you hack one device, you can make maybe one or five US dollar, but you, in order to make millions of US dollar, you will need to hack all the devices, which is very unlikely. Mm -hmm. So decentralization plus open source is, is a killer. Just to give a bit uh, of context here, um, when we used to design chips, and I think you might also have... Uh, FPGA, uh, all right. yeah. So, so but really going to the ASIC level, that these are things with 60, 70 layers. It was for us super easy to put stuff in there that nobody would ever notice. And we did. Yeah. We did a lot of interesting... Like, That's why it has to be open. Chip. Yeah, it has to be, because it's very easy to, yeah, as a designer and to also, put something in yeah, there. And also, if it's open source, then we'll scale really... Uh, rapidly, uh, the the architecture, the knowledge, and all the stuff. What happened in software? By having GitHub, well, now GitHub is not not really open source anymore because now it's own. But um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the thing is, like software now, we just copy 
bootstrap, you do a hackathon, you just copy the code from someone, and then you just think about the idea, how do you build a project, but then just bootstrapping and then creating the wheel again, and hardware has to be the same. Yeah, well, we, we are going to have a few minutes for questions in a moment, but um, just on that, so we've talked about the security issues and, and so on, but the scaling has come up repeatedly, and scaling is the perennial issue in the blockchain space. Are there, are there um, technical constraints as well uh, relevant to the IoT machine-to-machine -machine transaction that, that are um, um, problematic due to the scaling issues on-chain, in, um, in, in, on blockchain? Is that, is that, do you see that as a constraint? Probably not, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think Dimitri uh, mentioned very well. I think we, the, the, the only problem with IoT device is you have to trust the IoT that is sending the information. So if you get an IoT, a, a phone, or like a small Raspberry Pi that is uh, verifying a transaction in the IoT world, then you need to verify this, uh, this piece of hardware that never got um, hacked by someone to just send a, a wrong information. So hardware level, yeah. So, but payment channels and state channels and so on, are we, we, we have to wait for those to be implementable too? No, no, no. no. I mean, we, 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 we've done that. Um, like, for example, with those share and charge uh, things, uh, it's not so difficult. So, basic ideas, um, you lock up a little bit of your funds uh, f in order to have, like, a trust line between two devices. Uh, if any of the devices or human in that feels a bit uncomfortable, they can always exit this trust line and r redeem the current balance that they have, uh, but won't access your main wallet, just a little bit of it. And then you're basically communicating in a local circle of trust, mm -hmm. not only about tokens, but also about state changes. Um, and you can offload your computation as well in that same sense. So I see blockchains as being like grades of uh, trust, and you anchor it at the h hardest hashes. Uh, for example, the Bitcoin blockchain, it has, uh, I don't know, 25 million tera hashes uh, running at this point in time, which is about 10,000 times more than the top 500 uh, supercomputers. Mm -hmm. So think about the, the level of, of trust just coming by, by that compute power. And that's cost, that cost a lot. Uh, you don't have to use that level of trust for every every application. Yeah, I I, I think um, um, so. Uh, the um, the scalability problem is is a fantastic opportunity for more, for people to build other blockchain because they think that they um, they, they say oh eat for most of blockchain like Ethereum blockchain or whatsoever um, they cannot scale. I think it's a wrong wrong uh, pitch because blockchain like Ethereum is just a base layer of the protocol. And then what you add is like based on the on the use case you're trying to build high frequency trading or just uh, like some transaction on the, on the on the UI platform. It's very unlikely that I mean if you got a successful business you make a hundred transaction maybe uh, uh, I don't know a day or like uh, per day. So you just have to plug in different uh, uh, technology. For example, in blockchain in Ethereum you got like sharding, plasma, Redden, uh, like those guys over there, Redden that they're doing trust lines. Um, uh, you can do like micro ridden. That's what we've done for the plying carpet device charging station. You got the drone landing on the charging station. You can be sitting in your office, and then you will see flying carpet app telling you your your, your gas station charged ten drones, and you made five hundred pound. This was done by a micro transaction, meaning that just a unidirectional transaction system. Um, and then um, so you got off chain and on chain uh, scalability uh, uh, topics. Uh, so. If, um, for example, you mentioned, so Redden is more like whole chain transaction system, and then you can go for uh, Plasma, where Plasma, you basically are still like whole chain, but you use smart contract to scale the number of transactions, and then you can basically build, um, I don't know if you've seen the movie Inception, but it's basically the same. You build like child of child of child of blockchain, and you can increase of millions of transactions. So saying that blockchain cannot scale, I think it's wrong. No, yeah, well, it's just time. It's just timing. Well, it's well yeah. So meaning that I'm, I'm sorry for that, but I think like we can plug different modules in order for uh, to use and build a, 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 a project, and then you have um, what is the, the other one? Um, sharding, mm -hmm. and then sharding you just basically split the number of transactions in multi, uh, like make it really easily uh, like in small packet packets, and then you can make it, they're responsible as a node to verifying the transaction. So you, for now, yes, scalability is an issue, but 
short term, I don't see that a big issue. I think one of the things we need to remember, especially when we talk about small devices, is the power and amount of computation we are requiring. We are requiring more and more of computational tasks to run on small devices. And actually, to, even today already, there are struggles with some of the applications running and, and draining batteries, uh, let's say, on smartphones. So I think this is one of the things. And one, of course, when it's a drone, it's probably not a critical uh, situation. But if it's a small sensor or a small device, uh, a wearable, we need to be very careful. And I think if we come up with the protocols and, and algorithms uh, more and more that are power aware, and even processors and hardware that is uh, more power efficient, um, this would be nice. The other thing is the amount of memory that we continue to, the amount of memory that we need to have in small devices is, in, is increasing. And there are ways, uh, you know, there are ways of optimizing computer and memory, um, like Grafco was talking yesterday. But um, this is one of the things that we need to think in the future. How do we actually build devices that are capable of uh, all this uh, compute and memory tasks. Great, and no, so lots of design challenges. I'd like to just take a few minutes for questions, but um, thanks, big up to Trustlines and Raiden as well. Good, good work we need for this space too. Um, and the questions, anybody want to ask our distinguished panelists? Yes, please. Uh, is there a mic, is it kicking around? Shout out, and then if you repeat the question so we get it for the live stream. I'll, I'll just great. jump around. <laughs> Oops, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so I have a question about interoperability because it, it's great to have um, you know, a future world of IoT and you look at self-driving vehicles, but in particularly around autonomous vehicles and connected vehicles, um, we need zero latency. So we, we have Google, Sam, Samsung, we have Google, we have you know, everybody out there trying to develop their own systems, but how is this going to work? How these how are these systems going to talk to each other, and is there much dialogue going on between all the hardware providers in this area? Yeah, I see. Uh, very quickly, yeah. I think you've got. Um, so it, it's um, you will, people are building different blockchain. It's very unlikely that you you will only have one blockchain because people have their own interest and they also want to to jump into the game. And then you can you, you see like the project like from uh, Gavin from Polkadot. And um, this kind of so they're talking. The 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 end goal is to make uh, to be able to um, uh, between blockchain to talk to each other, and uh, so you will have a lot of different blockchain on the on, a, on the space, and they will all be able to understand each other and send transaction between each other. Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I think. If or Go ahead. You want to, so I think if, if uh, I, I may jump in here, I think you're uh, raising a very valid point about interoperability, and we have this issue. And I think uh, uh, one of the reasons we are interested in open systems is because it's a possibility to build uh, open standards, actually, that will be adoptable. And we see an issue, actually, even in autonomous cars, when mapping data is so expensive and everyone is uh, like in a style of mapping data. And then you see a car that is uh, running out of map data uh, in this territory which is available and they say we, I cannot drive anymore because I don't have map data so we want and we know this data exists somewhere else so we want actually to build systems that are connected how realistic it is in the next several years I don't know but uh, the intention at least we realize it very um, uh, we realize it very now very strongly that we need uh, interoperable interoperability in the systems of course so uh, that's indeed it's super important and I've been working three years on a w3c project called interledger which is basically you could call it TCP IP protocol for uh, transactions and ledgers mm -hmm. um, it's being well adopted by many institutions like, for example, Ripple and others. Um, there is the Decentralized Identity Foundation, which basically sets the standard for self-sovereign identities. Everyone that just uses that standard can already like extract uh, or communicate with the services provided by other self-sovereign devices. Um, so we have a transaction protocol that's standardized. We have an identity protocol that's standardized. Um, there's other working groups out there. Um, I, I think we still live in a space where everybody tries to do their own stuff and reinvent the wheel, and that's kind of toxic. Uh, whilst these standards are being established on W3C and IETF, I think that's basically for electronics the golden rule. Like, make sure it becomes an IETF draft. Um, and people should also start reading more of those drafts because many of these things have been developed in the 90s and uh, the early 2000s. So. Uh, I'll 
add as well, I mean, we've got a data marketplace, so we're bringing together all sorts of different types of real-time data, but we're also leveraging and working with other marketplaces. So Electrify, for example, would be a Southeast Asian uh, energy marketplace for, for electricity. So the devices are, are gathering energy data, the individuals uh, provide that and, and monetize it, but also then they uh, can help to stabilize the grid and get, get understanding of that. But that's, that's got its own token, but that's a marketplace. We're working with them as a marketplace. So the more that we can get other marketplaces who've got the same kind of like-minded attitudes, and there will be, you know, yes, some people will go off and have certain niches over here and there'll be niches over there, but as long as those can talk to each other because they are in this general mindset, then those combined will, you know, become a more efficient infrastructure as opposed to maybe some of those more sort of black box kind of approaches, and they will eventually, as time progresses, become a bit kind of, uh, what's the word, like defunct, because there'll be all these other marketplaces, which will, I think everybody understands the importance of interoperability in the space where we're building, but we're not all, you know, there's not gonna be one big giant marketplace that's gonna cover everything. It's just not the way it works, but the more that those like-minded can stitch together, before you know it, you'll get this kind of interacted, uh, interconnected uh, system that, that will in time become really uh, quite powerful. I think we've got time maybe for one, one more question, if anyone's got something burning. Yes, here at the back, let me, let me borrow your phone. Hi, I'm Alpesh. Um, my, my, my main question is actually about business models and decentralized business models, because part of this tech is really great, I'm a techie. But the challenge is how do you transform an industry or a market and how do you get adoption across that market? I mean, that's the fundamental question that, that I'm trying to answer. So I'd love to get your views on that. So um, this is something interesting about uh, the token ecosystem. Uh, we used to have equity there and work there, and they're separate. With a token, it's the same thing. If you contribute value to a system, utility, resources, or whatnot, you get token, and token is equity in the system. So basically, what you want to do is maximize the utility value of your network, hence your equity in the network also goes up. So this is types so of, you couldn't really call, there's business models on top of that, but the main thing is create a utility network of value. And with that, you can start thinking of basically creating other types of, of value exchanges. They don't always have to be um, B2B. They can be business to community or network to community. It's a different type of business thinking. Uh, um, I, I think the, um, so that's what we're not going for marketplace ourselves, I think the marketplace idea in terms of AI and blockchain is something that would not, it would be completely transparent because if each IoT device has its own AI or own AI agent and blockchain, then the marketplace will be the enter, like all the IoT devices, all the, the stuff around the, the place. So I'm not sure about building a marketplace especially, especially for all this IoT because those IoT will form the IoT, uh, the uh, the marketplace themselves, and then in terms of uh, uh, adoption or uh, uh, how do you force people or how do you make people use your system, it's already there because if you if the IoT device is your property, then as Dimitri mentioned, the utility token will already make money and then generate revenue stream for yourself. But I don't see like a website and marketplace and people can select some uh, some. Uh, uh, some uh, modules to to apply. I don't. I, for me, the marketplace is the enter of AI and blockchain altogether. I think if we're talking about adoption in terms of just going, I mean, <clears throat> I've always worked with commercial, fairly large commercial businesses, maybe more from a startup perspective. But you know, they, they don't change. They're like big ships. Some of them in terms of the, the thinking, they might have these entrepreneurs or whatever. But the, in order to really change their business models or start thinking about doing things differently, it takes a while. And there are still, you know, it still comes down to, like I was saying earlier on about collaboration, that might actually be three or four companies coming together and doing something a bit differently. You know, blockchain isn't, you know, suddenly changing everything about how collaboration and, and problems get solved, but it can make things more efficient. It can enable things to be done differently. And businesses are obviously very open to exploring that. What is, but what does it actually mean in practice? So again, I mentioned, I sort of mentioned the pothole detection thing, but, you know, being able to, 
actually do that, that's a, there's an evident problem that insurance companies and, and uh, you know, other companies, maintenance companies, are losing a huge amount of money. And if there's ways of actually bringing companies together, you know, you get these classic kind of win-win-win situations where everyone suddenly realizes actually blockchain can do this more effic efficiently. Uh, but it still comes down to some very uh, traditional ways of businesses just coming together. And, and, and actually, that's still difficult. The blockchain doesn't make that any easier. Um, but actually, if that it, it can enable these networks to come together more more effectively, and that's uh, yeah. So a provocative thought at the end, just okay. one one thought. So today we have brands as representation of central ways of doing so. The stronger the brand, the bigger value, the more power is in centralized doing of things. So my, I'm just curious where the blockchain in the future would disrupt this, and instead of brands, we will have curated labels. <laughs> That's a great <laughs> note to finish on. Thank you very much to the panel. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion. Thanks. Thank you.